The European Union has been crushing it with decarbonization in 2023. Now I'm not known to be the biggest fan of Europe's energy strategy, but I can't argue with these results. And in fact, I've dug up at least three super encouraging developments within this data. And that's what I want to share with you today. So hello YouTube, I'm Michael Size, and starting with electricity generation from fossil fuels, it is down massively. It's at an all-time low within the 9-year NSOE dataset, at a 40-year low within the dataset that our world in data uses, and realistically it's probably at a 50 to 70-year low if we had more data to compare. And it's hitting these lows both as a percentage share of electricity as well as in absolute numbers, being over 200 terawatt hours lower than 2022. Obviously this is super encouraging, but we still have to ask, is this decline structural and sustainable, can it go down further in the years to come, or is fossil fuel electricity going to rebound next year, and 2023 was just a fluke. I came into this expecting to explain why it's mostly a fluke, but honestly, from the arguments that I've been able to come up with, I would not be surprised if 2024 is actually even more decarbonized, and I think there are about 4 items to consider here. First item is nuclear. About 5% of the drop in fossil fuel electricity has been enabled by a year-over-year -year increase in nuclear energy. And I think I can explain how this increase came to be. Nuclear faced a 26 terawatt hour headwind from Germany shutting down its last reactors, a 9 terawatt hour tailwind from Finland opening a brand new reactor, an 11 terawatt hour headwind from Belgium which I believe closed down one aging reactor, and of course a massive 41 terawatt hour tailwind from France who finally fixed its reactors. In the end it all amounted to a positive 10 terawatt hour change and looking forward to 2024 there are no more closures that I'm aware of with Belgium extending its fleet by 10 years so we're looking at a 7 terawatt hour headwind from Germany which actually still generated some nuclear energy in 2023 but that's completely gone now a 4 terawatt hour tailwind from Finland whose newest reactor actually only started commercial operations in May of 2023 and quite possibly another 40 terawatt hour tailwind from France, which actually was still in the process of fixing its reactors in early 2023, but should be all finished now. And 40 terawatt hours should be easily achievable because it would merely be a return to 2021 production levels. But even if the bounce back in France was only, say, a quarter of that value, it would still mean that nuclear generation is going up, and this is important, because as long as it can avoid going down, it means that the fossil fuels displaced in 2023 are not returning. And if nuclear can do that, then I would say that it's doing its part. Of the four items, nuclear had the smallest contribution to the fossil phase-out, but for its part, I would categorize it as sustainable. So let's move on to the second contributor, accounting for 19% is the rebound in hydroelectric generation, and I'm calling it a rebound because 2022 was a massive drought year, with droughts stretching literally all over the continent from the Atlantic to the Black Sea. 2023 was a regression towards the mean, but I think it's technically still a bit low. So as long as we don't get another drought year in 2024, this value should be fairly stable. Just like nuclear, we don't really need hydro to go up necessarily, though that would be nice, we only need it to not go down, and the fact that 2023 was still below the mean, that means that in the average case we should expect this performance to be sustainable at least I think that's how statistics work, so I'm categorizing this segment as sustainable as well. The third element accounting for 38% of the fossil fuel phase-out was actually a massive drop in electricity demand and honestly this has me stumped. Now look, electricity demand in the European Union has been on a consistent downtrend since 2008, which is 16 years ago. And this is happening at the same time when we've been on this mission of electrifying everything. 
with heat pumps and electric vehicle and induction cooking and so on. And at the same time as heat pumps and electric vehicles have been accelerating, the demand somehow seems to be dropping even faster. At the same time the economy has increased, the population has increased and in general this statistic is so weird that I've seen a lot of people in outright denial regarding it. It seems impossible and yet there it is. I would guess that it has to start going up again at some point, so in the worst case scenario I would expect a complete rebound in 2024, similar to the rebound in 2021, but realistically I have no idea. But finally the big one accounting for a slightly bigger 38% is wind and solar, also known as variable renewable energy or VRE. Of all the energy sources, VREs have something fundamentally special about them and that is the near infinite scalability. To see what I mean, let's compare them to alternatives. Fossil fuels are abundant but still limited. They eventually deplete and you have to keep finding new deposits. And with something like coal, you end up digging Europe's biggest hole and then abandoning it to become a lake that's possibly toxic. Hydro only has to be built once as long as it's maintained properly, but you have to build it at a suitable location, and suitable locations are not abundant. In fact, in a place like Europe they have been essentially built out, so no significant hydro growth is possible from here. Nuclear faces some of the same limitations as fossil fuels, but in theory the constraints are much looser, especially if you start using thorium, but nuclear has all of its other issues, mainly cost and construction delays, and all of these amount to nobody building it. So the question of nuclear growth kind of stumbles even before we get to scalability. But VREs are different. Wind and solar already provide 27% of the union's electricity. And with that number in mind, go ahead and try the following experiment. Open Google Earth, zoom in on any random European city or suburb and try to see how many of the roofs have solar panels. The answer is almost none, but all of them could. Every roof, every parking lot, every big box store, every factory, every highway, every irrigation canal, all of this is land that has already been developed and which is suitable for dual use solar electricity. Now try zooming in on random European agricultural land and see how many wind turbines end up in the shot. Once again the answer is usually none, and I repeat that these VREs, which are nowhere to be found looking at the land that's suitable for them, are already providing 27% of the union's electricity. What all of this means is that when we see a drop in fossil fuel generation and we go to investigate further, what we're hoping to find with the investigation is a corresponding increase in wind and solar and for 2023 the biggest component of the drop in fossil fuel electricity can indeed be explained by a corresponding increase in wind and solar to the tune of 84 terawatt hours. Now is this increase real? or is it a fluke? With Hydro we saw that it was just a rebound, a normal yearly variation. And while wind and solar can have similar yearly variations, the jump in 2023 is way too big to be explained exclusively by this. Additionally, while Hydro was coming off a many year low, the record wind and solar are coming off a decade long series of yearly all time highs. So there wasn't even a low to rebound from, there was in fact an all time high from which to increase further. So far this is looking real. But just as a final reality check, do we know what could have driven this growth in theory? Obviously the elephant in the room is the European energy crisis, but we also had wind and solar permitting reform get passed at the end of 2022. And even if there hadn't been any of this, we should still expect growth simply as a tailwind from the global wind and solar growth trend. In short, we're seeing the increase in VREs as it's happening and we're able to understand why it's happening and the reasons why it's happening seem to be largely structural. So this is exactly what we hope to see. 
Now if VR redeployment continues at the same pace in 2024, that would mean that even if demand were to completely rebound to 2022 levels, VRE growth would still out pace it, keeping fossil fuels down. But even more so, VRE growth should generally accelerate. And we've never actually seen demand rebound that much in one year, not even in 2021. So to recap this segment, not only was 2023 a record low in fossil fuel electricity generation, but everything seems to be set up for 2024 to achieve a new record low as well, provided that nothing goes terribly wrong again. At the beginning of the video I said that I actually found three very encouraging developments and we're still actually on the first one. Don't worry, the last two are much quicker, but before we get to the second one, one last thing to note about fossil fuels is that the worst fossil fuels dropped fastest. And I'm not the person to get particularly excited about this, but I know a lot of people will, so here are the details. Hard coal, lignite, fuel oil and shale have all dropped to 9 year lows, and probably to 70 year lows, while gas has only dropped to 7 year lows, which means that among fossil fuels it's gaining market share, so the most polluting fossil fuels are dropping fastest. Now personally I would prefer to see more lignite and less gas, because lignite is domestic and cheap, while gas is imported and expensive, but Whatever. As long as we're getting rid of all of them eventually, the split is less important. Development number two is new VRE percentage share records in individual countries. In 2022, I was quite amazed to see that we had four member states, including two large ones, sitting at 35% VRE share, but in 2023 all four of them have expanded that to be in excess of 40% and this matters because that 40% was being achieved without anybody really noticing. It was routine and unremarkable and that's good. Anyone who was paying particularly close attention in 2023 would have noticed maybe a bit too many weekends with electricity prices at zero, but at the same time there wasn't a lot of negative prices, the market worked fine except for one day that I can recall, and as far as I can tell this is a perfectly acceptable situation for the grid. It's working, they reached 40% and the grid did not break. In my most recent video, I presented a simulation that arrived at 40 to 45 percent VRE share as being the point of maximum profitability. And with four member states already hitting this value, does that mean that VREs are topping out in these countries, or are they at least topping out for a while? I don't think so, because my original calculation was actually sandbagged in multiple ways, especially when comparing it to Europe. Firstly, my simulation tried to assume no subsidies and no carbon costs, but Europe does have significant carbon costs as well as some subsidies. Secondly, my simulation assumed no storage or interconnections, but the European grid is pretty well interconnected and it already has a lot of storage in the form of pumped hydro, and battery storage is actually entering the market already. Finally, my simulation assumed the equilibrium point to be that where the total profits of the industry are maximized, but that's not how capitalism usually works. And we might very well find that the actual equilibrium is found where profit margins are still positive, but only barely positive, because at any point up until that point, brand new companies would still be incentivized to enter the market with their own wind and solar installations to grab market share and profits, even if it erodes the profit margins of the already existing VREs. The fact that 40% was achieved in four member states, including two very large member states without much struggle or fanfare, makes me optimistic that a lot more is possible across the whole union. Finally, the third development is something that I've seen a lot of people get hung up on in the past, and that is solar in Northern Europe. 
Denmark has had a lot of solar for a while and Lithuania as well, but recently we're seeing significant solar deployment in Sweden, Estonia and Finland and these are countries that are extremely far north. On a global scale almost nobody lives at latitudes that high, it's way below 1% of the population, so whether or not solar works there is not really a big deal, but it does work and it is useful and it's all for the same reasons as in the rest of Europe. In the past people used to mock Germany saying that they're having to subsidize solar because they're so far north that solar isn't profitable, but the truth is that Germany had to subsidize solar because they were building it at a time when solar was crazy expensive, it wasn't profitable anywhere back then when compared to grid electricity. That has changed a lot in the meantime and we're now seeing profitable solar in every corner of Europe, deploying on a large scale in countries like Poland and the Netherlands and getting a foothold as far north as Finland. 2023 was a year that surprised me to the positive, but the fact that I was surprised means that my expectations going into 2023 were flawed, so what were the flaws? I think it all comes down to the amount of noise in the data over the past 4 years. 2020 had the pandemic, which means that 2021 had the pandemic rebound. The following year, 2022 had the collapse in hydro and nuclear, as well as the start of the war and the European energy crisis, and going into 2023 the demand downtrend continues to stump me. So I guess I was expecting that demand would be higher because of electrify everything, nuclear would be lower because Germany closed down its last reactors, hydro rebound would be negligible and VRE growth would be unremarkable and every single element ended up exceeding my expectations. I can't wait to see how my forecasting for 2024 turns out and if it's interesting enough I'll review the data at this time next year again. For what it's worth, which is not much at all, but for what it's worth, the first week of 2024 is the cleanest first week in the history of first weeks, so I'd say that we're off to a good start. Thank you for watching, like and subscribe, and make sure to comment, I read all your comments.